This is the RuneScape Grand Exchange, a central location for players from all over to meet, speak, and show off their skill capes. But more importantly, it's where people buy and sell any kind of item imaginable. What's particularly special about the Grand Exchange is that anyone can make massive amounts of money buying items at low prices and selling them at higher ones. It's called flipping. There are written guides, videos, and even whole websites dedicated to the art of flipping at the Grand Exchange. It's one of the only ways you can make a lot of money without much effort. It's not too quick to start, but you can slowly build up the wealth necessary to make huge deals in just days. The thing about flipping is that you have to build up the intuition necessary around what items to buy and when to buy it. It's just like the real life stock market. That said, unlike the stock market, the RuneScape Grand Exchange prices are a lot more consistent, which makes them more likely to be predictable. Today, we're going to see if we can use machine learning to hack that system. We're going to see if we can predict prices of items even looking days in advance to see when would be the best time to buy or sell. Now to get started, we need to collect the necessary data for training. A quick Google search will show you many websites with graphs full of data dating back 6 months to 6 years. Hence, I had faith that I could collect the data required for our model to work properly, one way or another. For example, this website has specific details regarding the current item's prices and the trends we could observe, with price rises and falls. You can also search for any particular item that you have in mind. In this case, we're going for Chaos Runes. This website will show you the price of an item each and every day over the course of six months. And some websites even have data dating back to 2012. And as we see below here, this website even has the amount traded every single day, which makes a really good metric for the future. Now eventually, I stumbled upon a really cool post on Reddit about the Grand Exchange API that was made publicly available. An API is an application program interface and if you haven't worked with them before, it's basically a request that we can send to receive some data from a certain application. In this case, we send a request with some specific parameters to services.runescape.com and get data back. They'll be in the form of JSON files, which we'll go over in more detail later. We go all the way down to see the API for graphs, which detail the prices of items over the course of the last six months. It's not much, but it's definitely a start. To see how the request would work, we don't have to look much further than our own browser to test it out. We can copy the base API link and then add whatever parameters we prefer to follow that link, like our graph API address for this first test. I'll change the item ID in the link to 560 for the item ID of the Chaos Rune. I take some time here to look up the item ID at a website that I'll show you guys later and have in the link down below. And there we have it, the timestamps and daily prices of Chaos Runes over the last 180 days. We could also find out more details about each item's daily values by using the API link for detailed info on any item. So once again, we go and copy the base URL and then the more detailed info link. Change the item ID to 560 for Chaos Runes and we get all sorts of info just for that day or today like the current price, description, even trends observed over the course of different months. Now let's write a short program that will allow us to use the data retrieved from the API links in Python. We start by importing the requests and JSON libraries. We'll need them soon to send our requests and parse the data in a readable format. I start by copying some code from my main chunk of code because I'm lazy to write it over and ignore the last line for now but the first line is basically the code required to get the same data we get from the browser. It uses the request library to get whatever is sent back to us with that link. 
the only parameter we have is the item ID, which will replace you with 560 or whatever number you prefer for the item that you choose. So here I immediately tried to print out what we'd get back from the request. What's uh, here it's stored in the variable we declare as R. Just as a little spoiler, we get what's called a HTTP response at first. What we'll see is the response status code that just details whether or not our request went through or what may have went wrong. You've definitely seen something like this before, like a 404 response, which means page not found. We see here we get a response of 200, which means we correctly got a response. However, it's not exactly what we're looking for in terms of data, in terms of what we want to print. So we have to first parse this whole response and get the JSON data from the text portion of our response. Here we simply take r.text and load it into a JSON format with json.loads, print out, and voila. We can now see the data that's present, but it doesn't take, it doesn't look too pretty. So after one quick stack overflow search, we find a small line to prettify the output. And here we see it in a much more readable format. And there we go. We now have the data in a format that's easier for us to read. And we now need to begin to process them, put together the data in a way that will be useful for us to train with. Here's the main chunk of Python code just for pre-processing the data. As you can see, the first part is all about getting the data from the request just like the last step. This time, we're using a list of items instead. I chose to gather data for all the runes available. For each of those items, we're sending a request for the Graph API and getting back a full dictionary of prices for the last six months. We have our own dictionary here named Full Dict, where we save the timestamps as the key and a list as the value. All we do is add prices to each of these lists just to make things easier for writing to the CSV later on. As for the second part of the code, we simply write each timestamp and its associated list as a new line to our CSV file, uh, which we created right here. Timestamps in the first column and prices for each rune at that particular timestamp in every other column, based on the labels at the top. Also, we get the item IDs from a website called Everything RS. As the name describes, it has every item ID you need in RuneScape. Before we get to building and training our machine learning model, we have to first explore the data set that we've created. Here I'm using Jupyter Notebook because I think it makes it easier to view and develop one part at a time. Our first step is to read in the CSV file and save it as a pandas data frame. We see here how it's structured in pandas, nice and neat. We quickly run df.describe, which shows us the mean standard deviation and a bunch of other metrics for each of the columns. At the very bottom, we also see the shape of the data frame. In this case, it's 180 days and uh, 13 runes with one column for timestamps. Next, we see the distribution plots for each of these columns. They're just plots of prices over time. Another thing that's important are box plots, which allow us to identify outliers and the kind of distribution that each column follows. Here I'm just plotting the box plot for chaos runes. Last exploratory tool for now, the coefficient table. It allows us to see how related each of the prune prices are to each other. Before I begin, I'd like to say that I forgot to normalize the values on the prices, which could definitely cause problems. Other than that, there are much better ways of selecting the best features for predictive analysis, like using random forests to find important features or using L1, L2 regularization and seeing what features are left. Disclaimer aside, the faulty coefficient table says that blood runes, law runes, and nature runes have prices that are quite related to the price of chaos runes that we're looking to predict. The numbers go from negative 1 to 1, and the further away from 0 they are, the more related they'll be. Even if they're negative, it just means that when chaos runes are high, nature runes will be low, which we can definitely take advantage of. We'll cover the other ways of finding these better features in videos to come. Now we're finally able to code and train the model for predicting prices. The notebook that I used is based heavily on the time series forecasting guide on the TensorFlow website. Most credit definitely goes to their heavily documented guides. 
We'll build upon this in the future, but for now we'll follow along and see what results we get. I'll only go over each chunk of code briefly as I plan to tweak and change a lot of the code to make the model even better in the future videos, where I'll explain the concepts in further detail. So please bear with the brevity of my explanations, but feel free to ask any questions down below. Just as we've seen earlier, we read in the data from the CSV file. Then we have to do one final pre-processing step specifically for time series machine learning. This first function essentially takes all the data as a series and spits it up into little chunks at a time for our future input and one value as the output. In this case, the input will be some number of days and the output will be the price the next day. The train split variable is basically how many data points we want to use for training. In this case, we'll take 120 out of our 180. In part one, we will just use the data from the chaos room column looking at no other features, no other runes. We will try to predict the future of chaos runes just on what we observe from the last 10 days. We normalize the data with the mean and standard deviation. Note that we have to normalize specifically with the data that we selected just for training, and these are the first 120 data points. We then declare the history and target variables that stand for the amount of steps in the past to look back at and how far into the future we want to look. We use the function from earlier to create a little chunks of data we want to use for our current neural network. Then we split the data into training and test sets. The data will, the data we created will look like this. Normalized data, 10 steps in the past, and one output for the current day prediction. Here we have two more functions, one just for formatting the timestamps from negative 10 to zero, just for easier reading and better understanding and another function to prop uh, properly format the plots to show what we're predicting. We start by seeing a baseline just to make sure that we can do better than a simple algorithm that wouldn't require any training. Our baseline algorithm here just takes the average of the last 10 time steps to try and predict what will come next. Here we see it's, a little, it's at least a little bit off. Now to train and test the recurrent neural networks, we quickly do a little bit to the data sets that we're going to train with like batching to make sure the time, um, training time is faster, shuffle to better represent the data and repeat to reinitialize the data set. Then we build a simple model. We build it with an LSTM layer with 8 units which is the size of the LSTM's hidden state, then one dense layer to get a single unit of output. We finally configure the model for training with the compile method. We choose the atom optimizer here for now and the mean average error metric to calculate our loss. We train the model by fitting it to the data set that we have with a certain number of training epochs, which is the number of times we run through the whole data set, and the evaluation interval, which is the number of steps to train the model at each epoch. After training 15 epochs, we end up with a validation loss of 0.4, but interestingly we notice that the validation loss is lowest at the 9th epoch, which is somewhere in the middle, but the loss on the training side continues to get lower. This could be a case of overfitting, and we'll look into fixing that in the coming videos. The first test shows some really good results, but the second and the third are increasingly disappointing. Let's look into improving the model by adding some dimensionality. We'll introduce the features we talked about earlier to train the model with and hopefully get better predictive capabilities. The extra features we are considering is, once again, nature, soul, blood, and law runes. We don't forget to scale and normalize the values this time. We first try things with a single step model, looking just one day into the future. We structure the data much like what we had in the univariate data. Instead, now we take into account multiple streams of data but we still look into how it all affect one output, which is our chaos rune. We split things into training and test sets. Then we shuffle, batch, repeat them once more. And lastly, we create a single step LSTM model with an LSTM layer of 32 units this time, a little larger to handle a little more complexity. We train with the same parameters and find that validation loss is pretty high. And I'm still not too sure why that happened, but I'm going to look deeper into the values soon. However, 
looking at the performance, it's working much better than what we've had previously with the univariate data. Now, time for the real challenge, predicting multiple steps into the future. So this is going to be the crux of our program. We don't just want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We want to, want to know what's going to happen every day in the next coming week. We want to see which days in this week is going to be the best time for us to sell, which time is going to be the best for us to buy. And it's going to be the main fuel in our program for the future. So we can mainly reuse the same method as earlier for putting together the data, just with a few more points at the end as output. We do all the same things other than have uh, the plotting method now show the extra points of output just like this. Our example shows a not very exciting standstill in price, but you get the point. We built the model this time with two LSTM layers and a dense layer to output the same number of points we chose. The validation loss during training is much higher this time, but I believe it's because the error of multiple points is added up, and thus causing the larger numbers. Finally, predicting into the future, we see that there definitely is room for improvement, but it's definitely better than just sticking to the baseline. As mentioned, we're going to have to improve. Our first thing to consider is getting much more data. This could be us just waiting for some amount of days and using the same API to add on to our CSV, or looking at some of those graphs people have had for years and scraping that data. We could also put some effort into speaking to experts to help us understand the field of flipping better, seeing what prices change, the outcome of others. And we can also look towards future engineering. All of these we'll look to in a future video. We can also tune hyperparameters so that our model works better and better for the needs of our data set. We'll do experiments in the future with the number of hidden units, batch size, buffer size, training epochs, and all the other hyperparameters you can imagine to make our model keep improving. We'll also try using different models entirely. LSTMs tend to need a lot of data to run well. We can try mixing up the models and having a whole ensemble of models. We could also try using transfer learning which is where we take a well-trained model from another use case like the real stock market and apply it to our limited amount of data, therefore needing much less data. Lastly, if we run into problems with overfitting, where our model keeps looking at our training data and doing really well there but doing really terrible with our validation stuff, we can apply regularization techniques just like L1, L2 or dropout. Please let me know which of these you'd like to know more about. I'm going to really enjoy exploring and improving on this so we can one day make bank with the Grand Exchange. Thanks for tuning in.